invite you to turn for just a few minutes this morning to back to the second chapter of Revelation. Begin reading from the 8th verse. The letter to the church in Smyrna. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And let me just say this. The book of Revelation tells us that he that hath part in the, in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. And the first resurrection and the second death are all things that, that need some time of their own to be devoted to. So we're not going to delve too far into that today except, except for me to call out two things here and, and then we're going to go back. Notice what it says here. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. What was that crown of life contingent upon? Jesus didn't say, I've shed my blood for you, and therefore I'll give you a crown of life. And this is Jesus speaking. Again, if we, if we go back into that first chapter where he identifies himself, you're going to find that, that he uses uh, the expression, the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Those are some of the descriptive terms that he uses for himself in that first chapter. As I've said, for most of the churches, he describes himself in some of the phrases that, that is used there. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Now, this crown of life, and, and this is important, but and, and, and I know I'm kind of coming at this backwards a little bit, but I think it's important to establish this before we go back and consider any of the rest of this. This crown of life that Jesus was giving them was contingent upon their faithfulness. If you are faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. That pretty well tells me that, it, at least in my heart and mind, that what we've got under consideration here is a gospel dealing and not one of an eternal nature, because if it was, me, whether I'm faithful unto death or not, wouldn't have anything to do with that crown. So because it specifies that the crown is contingent upon my faithfulness, that causes me to tend to look at these scriptures in light of what it says to the church in the manner of a gospel dealing. And under the angel of the church in Smyrna Rite, and again, with this pattern continues with all, all the seven churches. We saw, it, we saw it with the church of Ephesus. The letter is written unto the angel of the church, or the messenger of the church, or if you will, the pastor of the church, of whom the Lord said that he held them in his right hand, and he walked among the candlesticks, the golden candlesticks, which are representative of the church. So he is affirming again, and he does this to every church, he is affirming to them that his messenger that he has sent is his messenger, and his word is given unto his messenger for the purpose of it being distributed to the church. 
unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now, again, there's a lot of important information right there. These things saith who? Not the angel of the church. Not John, to whom the revelation was given. Not any of the, uh, of the other apostles. Not any disciple. Not some man. Not some angel. These things saith Jesus Christ. These things saith he, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now this is a very important message to the church that we both understand and bear record of the fact that this Jesus, this man Jesus, came and died on the cross, died for our sins, died to save us, but not just to save us eternally, but to be our Redeemer and our salvation here in this world, that by His blood we have the church of the living God in the world. I think if, if that ever really sunk into us, if that ever really, really found a lodging place in our hearts, people wouldn't find it so easy not to be at church. He thought of you enough, loved you enough to give you a church that he paid for with his blood. <laughs> Jesus died. Not just to give you an eternal home, but to give you a place of rest and peace and safety and contentment in this world. He shed his blood for you to have the privilege that you got this morning of sitting down together in his house to hear his word, to enjoy his fellowship, to sing his praise. Now, there, there's a popular theory in the world today that, that church really isn't important. If there was nothing else in the scripture to tell me otherwise, the fact that it meant enough for Jesus to shed his blood for it would be all the evidence I'd need that the church is important, that the church is not a take it or leave it, that the church is not a convenience, that the church is necessary to the faithful life of the child of God. And again, every church, he tells this, I know thy works. We might be able to put on a good face to the community, we might be able to put on a good face to the visiting preachers. We might be able to put on a good face to the ministerial association. But Jesus says, I know that works. Not just what we do, but why we do it. Not just why we do it, but how we do it. Not just as, as a... a, a a means of conforming so that everybody will think we're doing our part, but out of a sincere desire to be a help and a benefit to his people. I know thy works. Now that's not to say that he can't use whatever reason we do it for, for the benefit of his people and for his glory, but it, depending on what we're doing for and how we're doing it, it doesn't benefit us. Our contributing to acts is a good thing. There, I, I, I think it's a, it's a very good thing. I think it solves a lot of problems. But if the only reason that we're doing it is to assuage our conscience about how folks in the community are helped, then we're doing it for the wrong reason. We're not, we're not approaching it in the right way. We need to do it charitably. We need to do it in love. We need to do it prayerfully. And we need to do it with a sincere desire in our hearts that the people that are over that are acting according to God's will and God's word and that, that our part of, uh, of contributing to that is for his glory, not just so we can say, well, we're doing our part. I know thy works. And 
tribulation and poverty. Now you've got to understand a little bit about the situation and the circumstance of, of the times. It helps to put this in perspective. And then, but then there, there, there's a spiritual carryover in those things to me. If there is not a spiritual lesson for us in the Word of God, then all it is is a history. And I'm sorry, I've never believed that the Word of God was just a history. But sometimes we need to understand the historical background of it to get a clearer picture of what it might mean to us today. And the church, in, uh, I mean, the, the city of Smyrna was, was a jewel of its time. It had a beautiful, safe harbor for, for, the, for the landing of ships and the transporting of goods. It was on a main trade route. It was designed by, by Alexander the Great. I mean, there was a lot going on in Smyrna. It was a rich place. It was a rich city. And on the main avenue, so I understand that at one end of that main avenue, there was a huge temple to Zeus. And on the other end of that avenue, there was a huge temple to Sybil, who was referred to as the mother of the gods. They were bound as a city in paganism. Understand that because of this location, because of the trade and everything, there, there was a, a, a large contingent, apparently large contingent of Jews that lived in the city of Smyrna. In the times of the city of Smyrna, it was basically against the law to be a Christian. Now, in some cities, that wasn't enforced. But in the city of Smyrna, historically speaking, we're told that the people there demanded that it be enforced. Uh, some places, it was just a smack on the wrist. Some places, you could go, and if you had, a, if you had somebody high up in some of the pagan things, they could give you basically what amounted to a written excuse saying that you observed all the pagan rites and blah, 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 and you could show them that and they'd leave you alone. But do you see what was taking place here? For those people that did that, they might say, well, I never actually worship pagan gods. I don't actually observe pagan things. Yeah, but I got a piece of paper here that I'm showing people saying that I do so that I won't have to suffer any persecution for, for what I do believe and for what I do stand for. I know thy works and thy tribulation and thy poverty. Furthermore, the Jews, for whatever reason, were automatically exempt they, they automatically had a writ of excuse from the government pagan councils. So you begin to see that, that, that it was only the Christians that were truly targeted by this thing. Now furthermore, historically, it, it, we're told that the Jews used this to try to draw the Christians back into their synagogues and back into their legal worship because they had blanket coverage. If you were a member of the synagogue, they were going to leave you alone. They weren't going to bother you. They weren't going to persecute you. Of course, these were Jews that were still barely and virtually Jews, and so if you were going to attend the synagogue, you were going to live according to the law. Know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Jesus said, I know that if you're standing for me, you're being cut out of a lot of things. I know that you're being persecuted. I know that you're being tried. I know that you're being looked down on. I know that you're being mocked. I know that you're being pulled and tempted to turn away from the truth of my gospel. I know your works. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. But I know that you're rich. Child of God, let me ask you something this morning. Do you know that you're rich? I'm not talking about what kind of car you drive. 
or what kind of house you live in, or what kind of clothes you got in your closet. Many of you have seen the picture, and more importantly, the painting that Sister Julia Beth did of my childhood home. A little three room shack. And in the wintertime, if the wind blew hard enough, it would just run right up through the cracks in the floor. The little linoleum rugs that we had just bounce on the floor when the wind blew. The only electricity we had was three little naked bulbs, one in each room in the ceiling. I'm, I'm thinking back, I'm thinking there must have been two outlets in the house, one in the kitchen and, and one in the living room because Mom kept a little old lime green radio with a dial about that big on the front of it, plugged up in the kitchen that we could, that we could listen to a little AM radio station on once in a while if the weather was right. And Dad eventually got a television, and I know it was plugged up in the living room, so there had to have been an outlet in there. But that, that was about the extent of it. Our water came from an outdoor hand pump. I never remember being poor. I never remember thinking we were poor. And of all the places that we've lived, and, and, and every place that we've lived since then was, <coughs> by worldly standards, always a lot nicer than that place. But you know, that's the only home we ever moved away from that I ever begged for us to move back to. Was that little three-room shack. Because while we might have been poor in this world's goods, and looking back, we certainly were poor in this world's goods. I was never hungry. I was never lonely. I never felt like I wasn't loved. I never felt like I wasn't cared for. I had acres and acres of woods that I could get out and roam around in, and, and I could be the cowboy, or I could be the Indian, or I could be anything my imagination wanted me to be. But I was never poor. Now today, there are fancier buildings than this. There's still a lot that are not nearly this nice, by the way. There, but there are a lot fancier buildings than this. A lot fancier setups than this. There are folks sitting at home enjoying their church service, which is the way they enjoy their church service most Sundays. Because it's being streamed live. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. What I am telling you is this. All of these trappings, all of these things are not what make us rich. A congregation of 5,000 people is not what makes us rich. Needing seven pastors is not what makes us rich rich. What makes us rich is the love and the grace and the presence of Almighty God in our lives and in our service and in our reason for serving Him. Even if we still lived in little three-room shacks with no running water, by God's grace and mercy in our knowing of Him and more importantly in His assurance that He knows us. We are rich beyond measure, and there is no poverty, no tribulation, no lack in the world that can begin to compare with or erode away the joy and the blessing of that wealth. I know that I am a child of the king. Not a king, I am a child of the king. I am a child of him who is king of kings, and Lord of Lords. And moreover, I am that child because it pleased him to make me so. And I know 
the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now remember, this would have been important to those folks in that day because he was directly addressing something that, that was affecting them in their daily lives. The Jews trying to tempt them to come into the synagogue so that they would be safe from persecution as Christians. In other words, the Jews were, were saying, you know, we're concerned about you, come on in. When really what they were concerned about was adding to their numbers and, and, and converting these people from the truth of Jesus Christ, whom they denied. Now again, not all Jews denied him. And not all those that did were unknown to God. You know, there, there are, I'm firmly convinced that there are people in this world today that deny him that know better. Romans gave instruction concerning those people. Those that did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Well, now, you have to understand something. I can't retain something that I've never known. I can't retain something I've never known. And if I understand the scripture, God is only truly known to his people. God is only truly known to his. So that tells me that there are his who are more concerned with the things of the world, more concerned with their prestige, more concerned with the appearance of things, more concerned with being socially acceptable than they are with serving God. I know the blasphemy. I know the lie. I know the denial of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do we as God's children understand that there's not a little ground here? That if you're not serving God, then there's only one other service left. We, we, don't, we, we don't really stop sometimes to consider that, do we? But if we are not walking and living and, and, and serving God, if we are actively opposing the things of God, if we are setting ourselves up as being little gods ourselves, and the airwaves are full of men and women who are doing just that, that we are in effect the synagogue of Satan. We are showing forth that carnal nature, that human nature of ours, where he resides. You think about our carnal nature and what all the things that we do according to our carnal nature. Lying is a part of our carnal nature. Hating our brother is part of our carnal nature. What did Jesus say about hating your brother? That he that hated his brother is a murderer. Loving the things of the world more than we love the things of God. That's according to our carnal nature. Taking church is, as a convenience is a part of our carnal nature. 
And I will assure you that our carnal nature will always <coughs> take the things of God last, if at all. But Jesus said, I am alive and alive forevermore. You see, it is in his nature that of the second man Adam that we find our spiritual well-being that we find our joy, that we find our wealth, that we find our ability to live a faithful life. This next statement is very simple. But as I've told you many times, don't confuse simple with easy. It's not always the same thing. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. We, we all tend to fear hard times, don't we? We fear the coronavirus. We fear the flu. We fear not being able to pay our bills. We fear having to go to the hospital, having to go to the doctor. We fear being perceived as less than somebody else. We fear growing older. We fear dwindling numbers. We fear so many things. Jesus said, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Why? Because if we fear him, that reverential love that we should have for him. The scripture says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's why we don't need to fear. That's why we're not poverty stricken. That's why we are rich. That Again, this is why that we are able to be faithful is that our, our love and our focus and our attention is on him and on what he is doing, upon his promise in our lives, upon his assurance that he is alive and alive forevermore, that he is the beginning and that he is the end. And if he's the beginning and he's the end, then there's nothing in the middle that can change his will and purpose. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. Now, we haven't yet been literally cast into prison. We may never see that day. And we might. But I want you to notice the surety of this. The devil shall cast some of you into prison. No if ands, ors, or maybes. Don't fear what you're going to suffer because the devil is going to cast some of you into prison. You ever been a prisoner? I'm not talking about being locked up behind bars. Have you ever been a prisoner of your own doubts, your own fears, your own turmoils, your own tribulations? Jesus said, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. <clears throat> Did you know that the trial of your faith is precious? That your faith is tried so that I believe as Peter said that you may come forth as gold. And you shall have tribulation ten days. Now, I know there are a lot of different thoughts about that. But over the years as I've studied, just as come to realize that seven often rep represents a completeness or a maturity or a wholeness 
concerning the things of God. The number 10 and, and, and its multiples often have reference, I believe, to the law, to service under the law, and to uh, all the constraints and the confines of the law. And he tells them, ye shall have tribulation 10 days. And certainly, any of us that have ever tried to satisfy the law, and, and I think that would be most of us that uh, have come to know and love Jesus Christ as our, as our Redeemer, truly know and understand that He is our Redeemer, and that He is our Savior, and that we had no part in that happening. We've come that way. We've come to that understanding by attempting in one way or another to serve the law, either to keep what we read here or to keep what we were told and taught or to keep what's up, what, what the church tells us. Any, any, any way that we approach Him legally, Eventually, we, got to, we, we come to an understanding, don't we? That that's not going to work. That's not, I, I can't do it. I can't keep the law. I can't fulfill all those things. I, I'm, not, I'm not good enough. I, I'm not strong enough. I'm not able. I can't tell you the times over the years, back when I was smoking two and a half, three packs of cigarettes a day, that I got up every morning. Declaring that that was going to be my last time. Maybe smoke my last cigarette before I closed my eyes at night and, and that was it. I wasn't buying anymore. And I didn't until I passed the first store the next morning. Can't tell you how many things in my life because I knew that it was not honoring to God that I was going to quit and I was going to change and I was going to do differently and I was going to act differently and if I made it two days in any of those things, I thought I was doing pretty good. Most sometimes I didn't make it from one breath to the next. And I learned that I was, I was constantly in tribulation when I was trying to satisfy the law. Thou shalt have tribulation ten days. But then he says, Be thou faithful unto death. Remember the, the, the scripture that says that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ? Do you know how I believe that that happens? It's not because that the law actually teaches me how to draw close to him. The law does not teach me how to live in a way that, that is good enough that I deserve him. What the law teaches me is that I cannot do, that, that I can do nothing, that I can of my own self do nothing. The law taught me that I was useless, that I was worthless, that I didn't have any strength, that I didn't have any integrity. The law taught me that I was a sinner. And that taught me despair and fear. But somehow I never gave, I, I never gave up trying, you know. It you, was that your experience that even, you know, today you might know, I'm not going to be able to do this tomorrow. You got up with the determination, well, I'm going to do it. Until one day, you finally became dead. To the law. Again, the scripture tells that no, those that have come through the law are dead to the law. When you have when you have spent all of your effort and all of your purpose and all of your desire and all of your trying, and you come to the end of that and you say, I'm dead. I can't, I, I, there, there's nothing more I can do. And and then you just find yourself falling on your face before the throne of God and begging for his mercy and for his kindness and for his protection and finally confessing before the God of heaven and earth that, uh, that, that, that you know what you are. And you find on the other side of that that there's a crown of life.
Be thou faithful unto death. Don't quit trying. Don't quit doing what you're doing. But just know that whenever you have come through that and you have become dead to that, be faithful unto death. When we come out of that, then we see and know that we have a crown of life, not just for living over there, but for living here. That we have a crown of life that we might honor and glorify God in our being, that we might praise and glorify Him in our worship, that we might truly live a life that is, that is acceptable because Jesus has made us acceptable, that we are finally and fully able to understand that I can't do it and I don't have to. I need faith in Him. I need to exercise my faith in Him. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And again, it's like he that remaineth faithful, not being hurt of the second death, is contingent upon he that overcometh. And I'll leave that there for now. Thank God for his mercy. I pray that he will bless these thoughts that I have presented to you, that, that whether you agree or disagree, that it will cause you to go and to examine yourself according to his word, and that it will lead you to a closer place in his service, in his life, in his church, that he might be glorified in you. May God bless and keep you, my friend.